You notice I got a helper for this particular video this week. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring the big guy in to help me out is because you've heard me in the past talk about how your, your family needs to be part of the training. Um, it's, I feel like it's my responsibility to not only make sure I am prepared uh, for different emergencies, but also I want to make sure uh, my kids are prepared, my wife is prepared. Right? So <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about today about how you can actually bring your family in on this, how you can start training your kids. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, controlling bleeding and some of the different types of tourniquets that are out there and why you might choose one over the other if you have kids. Uh, and then also how to improvise some tourniquets in case you don't actually have stuff on you. All right. Um, so first of all, I, I think from about the age of four, we started training um, our youngins on how to control basic bleeding. I got two boys in the house and they're they're rambunctious little um, hard playing kiddos and they get scrapes and bumps and bruises and little bleeding here and there. And we talked at an early age about how, um, how we can stop the bleeding. Buddy, how old are you? We're five years old. Now, can you tell me what are the, the ways that we can help stop bleeding? Pressure, wrap it up, and lift it. That's right. Put pressure on it, wrap it up, and lift it. And that's going to stop the majority of bleeding out there, especially capillary type of bleeding. You need a scrape or even minor cuts, things like that. Uh, putting direct pressure on that wound and then wrapping it up with some type of bandage and then trying to elevate it you know, above the level of the heart um, so that you're stopping that bleeding. However, there are a lot of circumstances, um, for instance, a gunshot wound, sometimes uh, traumatic events in a motor vehicle accident, uh, an amputation, things like that where um, direct pressure and elevation might not stop the bleeding. So in that case, we might need something more, uh, hence the tourniquet. Um, there are a number of different tourniquets out there. Um, I would probably encourage you to look primarily at the soft T, that's the Special Operations Forces tourniquet, um, or the soft T wide, the combat application tourniquet, also known as the CAT, and then the rapid application tourniquet system known as the RATS. <clears throat> so first I'll talk about the CAT, combat application tourniquet. This thing is awesome. They've been using it since about 2005 um, in the military and it's definitely battle tested um, and has, has a ton of saves in real world operational environments. Um, it can be used one handed, it can be used on a buddy, um, but it's pretty simple. You're going to have a strap, some type of mechanical advantage called a windlass that I can twist it down on, and then some other mechanism to keep that windlass secure so it doesn't uh, twist, uh, untwist, and then loosen up on the tourniquet. So for one-handed operation, you want to already have a loop, put it on the extremity, get it nice and tight. That first pull should be nice and tight. You don't, uh, you don't want to be able to get more than three fingers underneath that. Anything more than that would be too loose. All right, so once I got it nice and tight, I'm going to take that windlass and I'm going to crank it. You probably are going to crank it on a real world scenario maybe three times, three full twists. But you know, for, for just <laughs> the video purposes, we're not going to do that, that too many times um, because it's going to hurt. So I'm going to secure the windlass in these clips. Then I'm going to take the rest of the strap, try to put it underneath there and over top of the, the, the windlass. And then I'm going to take this last piece of Velcro and strap it over top just like that. And I want to try to keep it on the outside here. That way, if for some reason I uh, passed out, um, whoever is responding on the scene would be able to see that tourniquet um, there. Um, ideally, I would remove the clothing so that nothing else impedes that. Uh, and in terms of placement on the tourniquet, um, you want to probably go, I mean, the textbook answer is between two and three inches above the wound. However, most people, practitioners out there, are gonna advise you to go over top of the, uh, the knee joint and over top of the elbow joint because that's how you have your best uh, chances for actually uh, stopping the blood flow. Now, how do I know when it's completely stopped and that tourniquet is tight enough? Uh, two things, one, I'll physically see the blood stop, and two, I'm gonna check my distal pulse, that's the pulse away on the, on the um, opposite side of the tourniquet uh, from my body. Right yeah, you would check the pulse right there and make sure that it is, is, there is no pulse and that's how we know it stopped. Now, with the combat application tourniquet on kiddos, you'll notice there's a rigid part right here. And sometimes, um, depending on the size of the extremity, it might not get small enough for a kid, but you can see right here, there's a gap. I can get two, three I can, fingers or more in there, and it's just not gonna cinch down tight enough for that. Which is why I would like to show you guys the rapid application tourniquet, all right? So, I got it, buddy. Hey, with the rapid application tourniquet, uh, it's very easy, compact. Uh, you can still do one-handed use on yourself. 
but I'm going to show you here on the on the big guy. All right, I'm going to basically take this, put this part. You can see I've already got a loop here. I'm going to take the tail, put it through the loop, and obviously on this guy, I'm, you know, on a, on a kid, you know, two to three inches above the wound, I'm going to try to get it probably higher up on that arm as I can. Obviously. <laughs> We're just sitting here in the living room, so I'm not gonna crank it down super tight, but I would be cranking this down tight. And you know, if you're putting this on a kid for real, you're gonna have to coach that kid and say, hey buddy, this is gonna hurt, but I need to do it because it's gotta stop that bleeding, okay? All right, so I mean, coach the kid, this is coach your patients, tell them what you're doing. Now to secure it, I'm gonna bring it back through one of these clips right here, <clears throat> these retaining clips, and I could even kind of double it down and, and do this on this other side as well to make sure it's it's not going to, uh, to move. Um, now you want to have uh, tourniquet material that's uh, probably an inch and a half to two inches wide, and and you'll notice that this combat application, excuse me, rapid application tourniquet is not that wide. It's only about a half inch. But if I loop it over itself a couple of times, two to three wraps, I'm going to get that width that I need to help um, uh, so that I'm preventing any kind of tissue damage. All right. So rapid application tourniquet. If you have kids. Um, or like myself, you know, I'm on a church security team and we've got several hundred kids every Sunday um, that we're trying to keep safe. And if I had to put a tourniquet on one of those kids, I might opt for something like this. Hey, buddy, thank you so much for, for helping out. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, a couple other things. Now, if I don't have um, you know, 47 cargo pockets and all kinds of really awesome uh, tactical jackets and backpacks and things like that that I'm... Um, that I'm carrying with me all the time, and I'm a normal person, um, you know, maybe I can't just carry those things in my pocket. Well, for instance, myself, I wear a suit and a tie for work for the most part, so I could easily take something like like a necktie, um, or ladies, uh, or even guys, you know, you've, there's a, a scarf um, that could be used, and I'm gonna show you a couple different ways that we can use those materials and things that we might have on us all the time. For instance, um, a carabiner, and a set of keys with a, a, a bigger key ring, and a heavy duty key ring. Now a lot of people will have that just kind of clipped on a belt loop, right? So that's an option. So for an improvised tourniquet, uh, you basically need the exact same things that you did on a manufactured tourniquet, which is um, some type of strap material, um, some type of mechanical advantage, like a windlass to make the windlass, and then something else that you can use to um, keep that windlass from moving uh, and untwisting. Um, so a necktie, something I wear for work, a carabiner, a lot of people, again, will have these kind of clipped on their key rings. So those are just a couple of examples. So what I'm gonna do for the necktie carabiner keychain version is take my keys, my key ring first, slide it through the material. And you want that kind of on the bottom side, say, uh, <clears throat> Then I'm going to try to get this roughly in the middle. It's you know if you're in a uh, working in a rapid environment, in a rapid paced environment, you might not take the time just to make sure it's perfectly in the middle, but try to have even amount of space or excuse me material on each side. So first I'm going to cinch that down nice and tight with one loop or excuse me one overhand knot. Then I'm going to make another overhand knot, and if you know a square knot, that would be perfect. But if not, no big deal. And before I cinch this down tight, I have a nice little loop here. I'm going to take my carabiner and open it up and put it right in there, and then I'm gonna cinch it down tight. And what I like to do on top of this, just to make sure this knot does not fail, I'm gonna tie another little overhand knot right on top. So keeping the carabiner, the, or the material, in the middle of this bottom part of the carabiner, I'm gonna to start to twist. And, oh, I'm not gonna to twist too many times, I think that's probably enough right there. What I'm going to do is slide the carabiner so that the, the knot is down on the bottom here, find my key ring, come back around, open the gate of the carabiner, and then fasten it to that key ring. And that should prevent it from twisting around on itself. Again, uh, you might have to give it like an extra half twist or something like that to make sure that carabiner uh, stays in place um, because it will move just about, I'd say, an eighth of a turn uh, when you, when you rotate that carabiner over to get back onto the uh, keychain. So that's a great option right there. You know, another option might be if I've got a scarf and maybe uh, a heavy duty ink pen, probably not just a plain plastic pen or a pencil, those are likely to break. Um, but an ink pen, Zebra F701, anytime I can give an opportunity to, to sh a shout out for this pen, it's awesome. Eight bucks on Amazon, get one. Um, or even something like a flashlight. 
Um, but again, I'm going to take my material here. I'm going to make a knot, or excuse me, a, just an overhand loop. Place my windlass on top, and then make another overhand loop, an overhand twist, nice and tight. It's pretty important to get that thing nice and tight. And then I'm going to start twisting this thing up, okay? And the more I can twist it, the more it's going to stop that blood flow, all right? And then the great thing about something like a scarf here is that as I twist it enough to get that, uh, that artery occluded, I've got two tails here that I can use to actually secure the, uh, the windlass itself. And what I'm going to do is basically go opposite direction. My windlass wants to twist this way counterclockwise for me. So what I'm going to try to do is keep tension on it going, going clockwise. So there's one way here. Wrap it around my windlass and come back this direction. Excuse me. This direction and tie it again. All right, it's not pretty, but it works, okay? Now, I will say none of these improvised type of tourniquets are as good or as effective as a purpose-built manufactured tourniquet. However, having something like this on you and being able to do an improvised tourniquet is gonna be better than the alternative of having nothing at all. So what I would encourage you guys to do is <clears throat> uh, get some training. Go to a reputable source, See, uh, search out the Red Cross, see what they have. Um, look for somebody that maybe teaches Department of Homeland Security's version of Stop the Bleed. Um, or check out, there's a number of vendors out there, folks that are actually providing this type of training. Make sure they've got a good background. Make sure they have, uh, you know, I don't want to harp so much on the military, but if they have a military medic background, like uh, Army Special Forces 18 Delta, uh, Pararescue, um, uh, you know, a Navy corpsman, things like that, uh, or a SWAT paramedic uh, on the civilian side, those are all guys that are gonna have great backgrounds that have probably done this stuff uh, real life uh, on real people to really save them. Uh, so those are the types of folks that you wanna seek out um, to, to give you some training. So I hope that was helpful, guys, on showing you how you bring your family uh, into this training and how you can actually use some of these different uh, devices out there, the tourniquets, uh, and also to improvise a few things. All right, until next time, uh, take care.